اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم قال للملئی حوله ان هذا لساحر علیم یرید ان یخرجکم من ارضکم بسحری فما ذا تأمرون قالوا أرجه وأخاه وبعث في المدائن حاشرين يأتوك بكل سحار عليم فجمع السحرة لميقات يوم معلوم وقيل للناس هل أنتم مجتمعون لعلنا نتبع السحرة إن كانوا هم الغالبين فلما جاء السحرة قالوا لفرعون أئن لنا لأجرا إن كنا نحن الغالبين قال نعم وإنكم إذا لمن المقربين قال لهم موسى ألقوا ما أنتم ملقون فألقوا حبالهم وعصيهم وقالوا بعزة فرعون وقالوا بعزة فرعون إنا لنحن الغالبون فألقى موسى عصاه فإذا هي تلقف ما يأفكون فألقي السحرة ساجدين قالوا آمنا برب العالمين رب موسى وهارون الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة المتقين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين إن شاء الله we're starting from ayah number 34 in the previous uh, session we talked about how Musa alayhi salam, when he went before Fir'aun, the conversation that ensued there, the back and forth that he had with Fir'aun. And then subsequently, how it finally came to the point where Musa alayhi salam presented the miracles given to him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, to Fir'aun and along with Fir'aun, everyone who was present in the council of Fir'aun. At this point in time, at this point in time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in ayah number 34, He tells us that Fir'aun turns to the people that are there, his counsel. He's قَالَ لِلْمَلَئِ um, Or rather, excuse me, let me just very briefly go through the translation of the ayat. And then we'll, from there we'll get into a discussion about the details. So in ayah number 34, Pharaoh said to the counselors around him, This man is a learned sorcerer. Ayah number 35, He means to use his sorcery to drive you out of your land. What do you suggest? Ayah number 36, They answered, Delay him and his brother for a while and send messengers to all the cities. Ayah number 37, To bring every accomplished sorcerer to you. Ayah number 38, the sorcerers were to be assembled at the appointed time on a certain day. Ayah number 39, and the people were asked. Ayah number 40, are you all coming? We may follow the sorcerers if they win. Ayah number 41, when the sorcerers came, they said to Fir'aun, shall we be rewarded if we win? Ayah number 42, and he said, yes, and you will join my inner court. Ayah number 43, Musa alayhi salam said to them, throw down whatever you will. Ayah number 34, they threw their ropes and staffs, saying, by Pharaoh's might, we shall be victorious. <coughs> Ayah number 45, but Musa threw his staff, and lo and behold, it swallowed up their trickery. Ayah number 46, and the sorcerers fell down on their knees. Ayah number 47, exclaiming, we believe in the Lord of the worlds, and I number 48, the Lord of Moses and Moses and Aaron, the Lord of Musa and Harun. So, as I was saying previously, that in I number, um, in I number 34, from where we're starting, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, قَالَ that Fir'aun, he said, لِلْمَلَئِ حَوْلَهُ 
Al-Mala in the Arabic language, this is the word that you saw in the translation that referred to his counsel and the people around him, etc. But the word Mala in the Arabic language comes from the root word which means for something to be full, for something to be filled. Alright, Malyan. Malatu Ka'si, I filled the, my glass. Okay, so it means to fill something up. And the word mala refers to the very top level of something, the very top layer of something that starts to spill out after you've completely filled it to the brim. That refers to the word mala. And based off of that, the word mala in the Arabic language refers oftentimes to quote unquote, as we have expressions in English as well, the upper crust of society. The aristocrats, the elites, the people who control things, the people who are at the places where decisions are made. That refers to the word mala. So, qala lil malai hawlahu. He said to those individuals, hawlahu, who were around him, because they were the people that would constantly you know, be around him. They would try to be as close to him and keep his company as much as possible. He says to these people, in هَذَا لَسَحِرٌ عَلِيمٌ Now I want to remind everyone about the previous session where we talked about the fact that, I, and I had alluded to this, that Fir'aun basically felt like he was losing face in front of his people. First of all, through the conversation between him and Musa alayhi salam, that every single time he said something to Musa alayhi salam, Musa alayhi salam responded with such eloquence and intelligence and sophistication and dignity that Fir'aun just continued to feel like he was losing the room, like he was losing face. And then particularly when Musa alayhi salam throws down the staff and it becomes this gigantic serpent and he pulls his hand out and it's glowing for everyone to see, now Fir'aun feels like he's completely lost everyone in the room. So that's when he turns to the people around him and he says, إِنَّ هَذَا لَسَاحِدٌ عَلِيمٌ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala communicates to us that the urgency and the desperation that was there in Fir'aun's words and in his voice, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that he uses two degrees of emphasis. Inna is for emphasis. And the lam that is on sahil, la sahilun alim, that lam is also for emphasis. So there's two degrees of emphasis. Then he uses the word hadha. That's when you point at someone, you point at something. Of course, who else would he be talking about? He didn't have to say hadha. But when you say hadha, it shows a lot of desperation. Like somebody shouting. He's pointing at him. And he's yelling and shouting that there's no doubt about the fact. This guy surely, certainly, this guy, Sahid, he is a magician. And not only does he say magician, but he adds on to that, he says, Alim. He's a very knowledgeable magician. He's an expert magician. Where he's entranced everyone here. Did you see what he just did? Did you see what he just did? He played a trick on all of us. That's who this guy is. And then he continues on, and the Mufassirun, Imam al-Razi rahimahullah ta'ala, he mentions here that what Fir'aun does now, what he transitions to now, what he's already started and what he furthers now, is something that is the quote-unquote, again, oldest trick in the book. It's the oldest trick in the book. Where now he creates a narrative. Alright, he creates a story, he creates a narrative, propaganda. And he starts creating paranoia about Musa alayhi يُرِيدُ أَنْ يُخْرِجَكُمْ مِنْ أَرْضِكُمْ بِسِحْرِهِ He wants to do what? What does he want? I mean, granted, okay, he's an expert magician. We see that. That's, that's been established. But what does he want? What's the objective? What's the end game here? Nobody just walks into a place and just puts on a show and then just walks right out. He wants something. What does he want? And we've already established other places in the Qur'an that the Prophets would all come with this messaging where they would basically say that لا أسألكم عليه مالا لا أسألكم عليه أجرا إن أجري إلا على رب العالمين They would say, I don't want your money, I don't want any type of material means from you because my reward is with God. I'm not here to ask you for your dunya. I'm not here to ask you for your wealth and your material belongings. I don't want power. I don't want influence. And again, this is being revealed to the Prophet ﷺ at a time when the Quraysh had already exhausted all these different means. We know very famously that the Quraysh went to Abu Talib, the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, and they pleaded with him. Dad, talk to your nephew. We have offers. 
that we can come to some type of an understanding. Wealth, we can make him rich. Power, we'll give him a seat at the table. Influence, we'll send him out to negotiate on our behalf to other tribes and peoples. What does he want? We'll make it available. And the Prophet ﷺ again, even more famously, the Prophet ﷺ turned it down in such a beautiful, powerful, profound fashion where the Prophet ﷺ said that if they put the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left, I would not compromise, I wouldn't give it up. I have a mission. And I'm here to achieve and accomplish my mission. And so, Musa alayhi salam, of course, has already made this very apparent and clear. This was a sunnah of all the prophets. This was an instruction. قُلْ لَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ Allah would tell, command them. The first thing you do is you let them know that I'm not here for any type of worldly means. I don't want nothing from your worldly stuff. So Musa alayhi salam made that clear. So it still leaves a question on the table, now that he's creating this narrative, he's this expert magician who's coming in here to just razzle and dazzle you, to wow you. So then, what does he want, is the question. That's the question y'all need to be asking yourselves. You see how he's playing that game? That's the question you need to ask yourself. What does he want? He says, I don't want anything. Who doesn't want anything? There's nobody who wants nothing. يُرِيدُ أَن يُخْرِجَكُمْ مِنْ أَرْضِكُمْ بِسِحْرِهِ What he wants is to oust you from your land by way of this magic. That he's come here to intimidate you, to frighten you, because Fir'aun read the room, and everyone was somewhere in between intimidated, just completely flabbergasted, or just outright, downright just scared. Everyone was somewhere in between there. So he read the room and he said, you know what he's trying to do? He's trying to scare you, intimidate you, and then he'll push you out of your land. And then he says, فَمَاذَا تَأْمُرُونَ So now that you all understand that this isn't just him against me, this is him against us. The us versus them argument. Right? This is him against all of us. In another place in the Quran, in Surah Taha, he even says, muthla." He's against your way of life. We heard that before. Right? He's against your way of life. So now what are you going to do? This isn't about me anymore. This is about all y'all. So what are you going to do? فَمَاذَا تَأْمُرُونَ What do you think I should do? And so now they all respond. They say, Qalu arjih. Arjih. Now this is a very interesting word in the Arabic language. It actually comes from raja, raja'a. Arja'a yurji'u. And the verb actually is arjihu. Arjihu. And the word arja'a yurji'u, irja, from this you get the name of a very um, old, uh, you know, Group that had arisen in early Islamic history called the Murji'a. Alright, Arja'a Yurji'u Irja in the Arabic language it refers, it means to delay something, to push something off, delay something. Okay? And so the verb is Arji'hu, delay him. But what you do in the Arabic language is again, when I even pronounce it, you can see how I have to slow down and stop and enunciate because they are letters that are come from very different places of pronunciation. And when they all come together, it's not very easy to pronounce. So you have to say, arjihu. And that's not very smooth off the tongue. So what the Arabs would do is, in this particular instance, they would drop the last letter that creates kind of that abrupt sound, arjihu. And they would just say, arjih. Arji, all right. So, but the word is arji who, which means delay him. Delay him, right? Just kind of create some excuse or create some circumstances that just kind of puts off the situation. Arji who arji wa akhahu. Delay him and his brother. And again, we're reminded of the fact that Harun Ali Salam is still there. So delay him and his brother. Wabath, and while you buy yourself some time. وَبَعَثْ فِي الْمَدَائِنِ حَاشِرِينَ Send out 
into all the different cities. The word Madain is the plural of the word Medina. Medina. Okay? So what it means is all the cities, Hashirin. And the word Hashirin comes from the word Hashar. The word Hashar means to gather. To scrounge things together, to gather things together. Hashirin. So send out recruiters. A good word for this in English that we're familiar with is send recruiters out into the land. Scouts and recruiters out into the land. What are they out there recruiting for? What are they looking for? So in ayah number 37, he says, Ya'tuka, they say, Ya'tuka bikulli saharin alim. That these recruiters and scouts will go out and they will bring to you, O Fir'aun, bikulli saharin alim. They will come back to you with each and every expert magician, master magician that they can find. The word sahar means master magician. Alim further means like experienced, if you will. Experienced master magician. Every single one that they can find. Now, I number 38. So this is basically the plan. So take a quick pause right here. This was the plan. And what they did was, they uh, other places in the Quran and other narrations, it also mentions that they basically told, they kind of delayed the matter with Musa a.s. and Harun by saying that, look, we would refute you right now but we want to make a spectacle out of it. We want everyone to see what happens. So we're going to make a public announcement. And Surah Taha mentions this, يَوْمُ الزِّينَةِ وَأَنْ يُحْشَرَ النَّاسُ الدُّحَنِ That we will gather everyone together on what was their uh, version of a national holiday, يَوْمُ Zina, Which... Some of the scholars like Razi and Ibn Kathir and others mentioned that in the Torah you find references for this as well. That it was called Yom Zina, the day of beautification. Because that was the day everyone would dress up and come together and they would have carnivals and festivals and get togethers and things like that. So we'll wait till Yom Zina, when everyone has time off and everyone can come together. And we'll meet in the mid-morning time. Not early in the morning, where it's difficult for people to get out. Not too later into noon or the afternoon, where it's too hot, where people don't feel like coming out. But we'll meet at 9 a.m. Gives everybody enough time to get out there, yet it's not too hot for everyone to gather. And we'll gather everyone together in a big open field. Big open place. And everyone can witness what will happen. And so this is how they put it off. Musa a.s. of course understanding the game they were playing. But of course, Musa a.s. knowing how everything was going to end, because he has Allah on his side. وَكَانَ حَقًّا عَلَيْنَا نَصْرُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَأَنْتُمُ الْأَعْلَوْنَ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that helping the believers is a promise that God has made. And Allah says that you will always come out on top as long as you are true believers. So Musa a.s. said, fine, if he wants to make a bigger spectacle, if he wants to dig a deeper grave, who am I to say no? Fantastic. Fine, we'll meet whenever you want to. And that's when they send their recruiters out and they come together with all these different, you know, expert ma master magicians from all across the land. And they gather them together. And the narrations mention that there's different narrations and none of them are fully to the level of any type of credibility or authenticity. So Allah Ta'ala Alam Bis Sawab, God knows best, Allah knows best is the, is the best answer. However, that being said, Ibn Kathir does mention a number of different narrations between 12,000, 14,000, 18,000, 30,000, Wallahu Alam. How many magicians they got together, but suffice it to say that they got together a huge number of magicians. So they gather all the Fajumi as Saharatu, ayah number 38. All the magicians are gathered together. Limiqati yawmin ma'lumin. Limiqati yawmin ma'lumin. That they are all gathered together for the appointments of that day that had been fixed. They're all gathered together on that day. All the magicians are brought in, they're recruited, they're brought there. Okay, there's a little linguistic interesting nuance that was pointed out uh, by Zamakhshari and others that 
There's a very similar type of construction that's found in another place in the Quran where it says, لَمَجْمُوعُونَ إِلَىٰ مِيقَاتِ يَوْمِ مَعْلُومٍ That everyone shall be gathered together to the appointment on that fixed day. To, إِلَىٰ Sound familiar everyone? Say yes please. Yes. Thank you very much. Zakallah khair. I appreciate it. Alright? إِلَىٰ To the appointment on that fixed day. Here, فَجُمِعَ السَّحَرَةُ li miqati. The lamb. Two different harfs. Harf of jal. Over here, it uses a lamb that they were gathered together for the appointment on the fixed day. But when it talks about the day of judgment, he says, all of humanity shall be gathered together to the appointment on that fixed day. Very similar construction. Jama gathering together. Miqati yawmi ma'lu, appointment of a fixed day. But Allah uses two different prepositions for both of them. For the magicians gathering together, for the showdown with Moses, the four, lam is used, that preposition is used. But when, Allah, when it talks about gathering humanity together for the reckoning on the day of judgment, then ila is used. So he talks about it, why? Very similar constructions, but why does Allah use two different prepositions? And of course, very mind-blowingly, he presents the fact that when you use a lam, that talks about the purpose of this particular gathering, but lam does not have a sense of finality to it. They were gathered together that day for that particular purpose, but then they were eventually going to go somewhere else afterwards. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses ilah, it's being used as a final destination. That on that day, when people will be gathered together, the groups that they will be grouped into, the, the groups that they will be put into will be the final allocation that they will ever receive for the rest of eternity. And that's why Allah uses the ilah when talking about the Day of Judgment. But not when talking about people gathering together in this world, He doesn't use that ilah. Very fascinating. So, but we're not done yet. Okay, so all the magicians are brought forth. But now in ayah number 39, they want to create an audience. They want the spectacle. And so in ayah number 39, And it was, an, it was said to the people. Whenever you have this type of a dynamic where it says, it was said to the people, that has the element or it has the meaning of like something being announced. Something being proclaimed, announced. nasi, And it was announced to the people, Hal antum mujtami'un? Will all of you also be gathering together? Will all of you also be gathering together? And again, in the tafsir of Surah Taha, I spoke about this, that there are narrations, again, Wallahu ta'ala alam bi sihatiha. There are some narrations, and God knows best to their authenticity, but it doesn't contradict anything we find in the Quran. That what Fir'aun furthermore did was that he, you know, passed out and promised a lot of free things that day. Of course, the thing that works even till today is free food, right? So he promised free food for everyone who would come out. And some of those narrations of the Isra'iliyat, they also mentioned that he gave out a lot of gifts and money and goods and things like that. Just trying to create the biggest audience possible. وَقِيلَ لِلنَّاسِ هَلْ أَنْتُمْ مُجْتَمِعُونَ Will all of you be gathering together as well? Will, will everybody be coming out? And then in ayah number 40, you see the element of the propaganda, لَعَلَّنَا نَتَّبِعُ السَّحَرَةَ إِنْ كَانُوا هُمُ الْغَالِبِينَ Which translates to, so that we may follow the magicians if they are able to achieve victory, if they come out on top. So that we may follow the magicians if they come out on top. Now, some commentators on the Qur'an basically talked about the fact that this was like a compromise that they basically made by saying that, look, if Musa alayhi salam, of course we can't allow him to succeed, we can't allow him to come out on top here. But if these magicians come out on top, then people will at least believe in these magicians. And while that was something that Fir'aun didn't like to hear, but they convinced Fir'aun that even if they end up believing in what the magician, in the magicians, that the magicians have some power, and then the magicians all turn around and all basically 
you know, stake their loyalty and their allegiance to you, you still have the power. You just use the magicians as kind of an idol. All right? To draw the attention of the people. So, because Fir'aun immediately was worried about the fact, but okay, fine, I don't want people believing in what Moses is saying. But if these magicians, they outdo him, then people are going to start believing and following these magicians. But then they convince Fir'aun saying that, however, that might seem problematic to you, but at least rest assured that these magicians will... Pl- uh, they'll pledge their allegiance to you. So you still win. But Imam Razi, Imam Ibn Kathir, Imam Qurtubi, many, many of the major Mufassirun, they actually disagree with that assessment of this ayah. Rather, they say that that's taking the word نَتَّبِعُ ittiba, taking it in its technical meaning as we know it, to follow someone's religion. But it's being used more in its linguistic meaning. That they will basically fall in line behind the magicians in the actual competition. And so what's actually being said is everybody gets together and they incentivized everyone coming together by offering them free food and free stuff. And when they came there and they fed them and gave them stuff, all right, they created the mob and they fed the mob then what did they do? They told the mob, now your job, they hand them out. You know when you go to like a, a home game for a team? They give you all free t-shirts, right? Or they give you the towels of the team and then, right? So they're just trying to create the optics of the fact that these are all hometown fans here. Home field, home court advantage, right? So they feed the mob and then they basically tell the mob that you got what you wanted, you got all this nice stuff. You hold it out in front of them, you dangle the carrot. And when the hungry person reaches out, you say, well, who are you rooting for? Who are you rooting for? Want a free t-shirt? Who are you rooting for? The magicians, right? Okay, just making sure, here you go. Right, so that's what you do. So that we can all cheer on the magicians so that they're able to come out on top. So they created this whole thing. Everything was slanted against Musa Everything, right? They rigged the entire situation. فَلَمَّا جَاءَ السَّحَرَةِ Now what happens is, on the day of the actual showdown, the magicians, all of them come forth and they are presented before Fir'aun. Right, so kind of like just to rally the troops, if you will. قَالُوا لِفِرْعَوْنِ They said to Fir'aun, أَإِنَّ لَنَا لَأَجَرًا إِن كُنَّا نَحْنُ الْغَالِبِينَ Will there be a reward for us, a significant reward for us, if we're able to come out on top? We're assuming there will be a significant reward for us if we come out on top. And again, some of the narrations mentioned that obviously they were scouted, they were recruited, they were brought out. So it goes without saying that they were taken care of, accommodations, food, maybe even paid. But that was all fine. That was coming through the system. Okay? Whatever governmental agency recruited them, that was coming from there. But now that they're standing in front of the king, they saw an opportunity. And so they said... That's fine. We got whatever we got from the governmental agency. But now we're talking to you, the king, right now. So what is it that you especially, as your gift, are offering us, incentivizing us to go out there and do what we can do? So Fir'aun, in ayah number 42, he responds, قَالَ نَعَمْ He says, yes, of course, there will be a very worthwhile reward for you. نعم وَإِنَّكُمْ إِذَنْ لَمِنَ الْمُقَرَّبِينَ And what is that worthwhile reward? That there's no doubt that in that circumstance that you are able to come out on top إِذَنْ In that case, in that scenario لَمِنَ الْمُقَرَّبِينَ You will become a part of the inner circle. Okay? Now, Somebody hearing that might say that that doesn't sound very enticing. 
right? Ru'akir. Or somebody might think, wow, this guy thinks a lot of himself. And you'd be correct, he did think a lot of himself. Anna rabbukum al-a'la. This guy told people to worship him. So of course, he thinks somebody getting to stand close enough to him to be able to see him was some huge blessing bestowed upon someone. But more practically speaking, politically speaking, you have to understand the language that's being spoken here. Of course, by being a part of the inner circle, what happens now? You're rubbing, you're rubbing elbows now with the most powerful, the wealthiest, the most influential people in the land. So you're pretty much set for life. You'll be a part of the elite, noble, ruling class. And these magicians, many of them, because remember he said, fil madain, madain. They went far out into the land. So many of these people might have been coming from the outskirts, they might have been coming from humble places, humble beginnings, and they didn't have much. They could have never dreamed of being part of the elite ruling class. But that's what they're being offered now, that's what they're being promised. So now, Surah Taha talks about this in a lot more detail. But they end up in the actual arena. They end up there in the arena. In ayah number 43, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that when they end up in the arena and they're standing across from one another, there's these tens of thousands potentially of magicians on one side. There's a horde of humanity that has gathered all around them. Okay? Watching and yelling and shouting and screaming the mob in all its glory. And on the other side, you got Musa and Harun alayhim as Two guys standing there. And in, in Surah Taha, it mentions that they actually say to Musa, Ya Musa, imma an tulqiya wa imma an nakuna min al mulqin. That are you going to throw, are you going to go first or should we go first? And Musa alayhi salam said, Qala bal alqu. He says, No, no, y'all go first. Okay? Now, what does that exactly mean? How do we exactly understand that? There's been a lot of discussion about that, right? And from a strategic point of view, you could argue either way, right? You take the kickoff in the first half or in the second half, right? Sorry, it went there, but it did. We're there now, okay? So you could talk strategy all day long. But typically, particularly in the case of Munadhara, so intellectually speaking from the case of Munadhara, all right? the more experienced, wise individual is usually more comfortable with letting the opposing party speak first, completely empty out everything they have to say, and then basically going about in terms of just taking them apart. And we see the Prophet ﷺ do this. When the Prophet ﷺ was confronted by Walid bin Mughira, what happened? Walid bin Mughira came and started talking at the Prophet ﷺ. And he talked, and he talked, and he talked, and he talked. And finally, after a while, when he finally stopped, what did the Prophet ﷺ say? Afaraqta ya abal wali? Are you done? Are you sure? That's it? Nothing else? And he said, no. That's it, I'm done. That's all I have to say. The Prophet ﷺ said, okay. Now allow me. And then of course very famously, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم حامي كتاب فصلت آياته قرآن عربي لقومي عالمي Right? Then the Prophet ﷺ recited Surah Fussilat, Surah number 41. And by the time he recited about what we would call about two pages worth of the Surah, Walid bin Mughira, he had gone pale. And he finally reached out and he put his hand on the mouth of the Prophet ﷺ and he says, Please, I ask you for the sake of kinship, like family, just please stop. So Musa salam takes that particular approach here. Y'all go first. And, but the way, that entire back and forth is not mentioned here, but something else is highlighted here. 
In ayah number 43, he's قَالَ لَهُمْ مُوسَى أَلْقُوا مَا أَنْتُمْ مُلْقُونَ Musa alayhi salam said to them, Y'all do whatever it is that you're going to do. Alqu ma antum mulkun. Y'all do whatever it is that you're going to do. And the way that Musa alayhi salam says that, this is it's not necessarily arrogance, but there is a level of just dismissal. There's a level of just kind of how you tell a child. Just go play. Do whatever it is that you want to do. Hurry up, hurry up. I don't have all day. Alqu ma antum mulku. Y'all do whatever it is that you want to do. So now, in ayah number 44, the Quran mentions, فَأَلْقَوْ حِبَالَهُمْ وَعِصِيَّهُمْ And so they threw down their ropes. Hibal refers to ropes. Habal, hibal is a plural. Their ropes. وَعِصِيَّهُمْ And their staffs. Okay, they also had these staffs. They had heard, they had prepared. They had a whole routine planned out. So they threw down these ropes and these staffs. And this is where in the Qur'an, it's mentioned in a couple of different places, in a couple of different ways, it actually talks about what they precisely did in this situation. So, in one place, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in Surah Al-A'raf, سَحَرُوا أَعْيُنَ النَّاسَ وَاسْتَرْهَبُوهُمْ وَجَاءُوا بِسِحْرٍ عَظِيمٌ سَحَرُوا أَعْيُنَ النَّاسِ They played a trick on the eyes of the people. It was an illusion. They played a trick on the eyes of the people. In Surah Taha, Allah says, فَإِذَا حِبَالُهُمْ وَعِصِيُّهُمْ يُخَيَّلُوا إِلَيْهِ مِنْ سِحْرِهِمْ أَنَّهَا تَسْعَى that they threw down their ropes and their staffs, and then they had some type of trick that they played, that it made it look like yukhayyal. Yukhayyal means people thought. It didn't actually move. Their ropes and their staffs, their sticks, did not become snakes. But it looked like to the people as if they were moving. Yukhayyalu ilayhi min sihrihim annaha tas'a. People from a distance, they thought that the staffs and the ropes had become snakes, that they were moving. Okay? And here in this particular surah, there's a different type of reference that is made to that, and we'll get to that in just a moment. So first of all, in ayah number 44, it says that they threw down their ropes, they threw down their sticks, وَقَالُوا And then they said, بِعِزَّةِ فِرْعَوْنَ بِعِزَّةِ فِرْعَوْنَ Alright, they took an oath. They said that we swear by the might of Pharaoh. And this is, unfortunately, a practice that existed and to some degree even still exists in a lot of different cultures and societies and communities where people, in order to win favor with somebody of power and influence like a king, that they'll swear by the king, the might of the king, the life of the king, the power of the king, and so on and so forth. All right? Of course, in the Islamic tradition, this is something that's completely forbidden. And there's an authentic narration of the Prophet ﷺ that talks about this, where the Prophet ﷺ in the narration that's found in the books of Abu Dawood and the Muwatta of Imam Malik and the Sahih of Imam Muslim, among many, many other books. It's narrated uh, by Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And there's a couple of different narrations. Even in Bukhari, there's a narration where the Prophet said, لا تحلفوا بآبائكم ولا بأمهاتكم ولا بالتواغيتي. The Prophet said, do not take oaths upon your fathers, nor upon your mothers, nor upon any other false deities or powers, kings and rulers. Don't take oaths upon those things. لا تحلفوا إلا بالله ولا تحلفوا بالله وأنتم صادقون He said, if, do not take an oath except by Allah. That you can only take oaths in the name of Allah. But then the Prophet ﷺ does add on, however. Does that mean that we can run around just 
Wallah broing all over the place, right? No, the Prophet ﷺ says, وَلَا تَحْلِفُوا بِاللَّهِ وَأَنْتُمْ صَادِقُونَ Do not take an oath in the name of God unless you are absolutely truthful. And the Prophet ﷺ would, وَالَّذِي نَفْسِي بِيَدِهِ I swear by the one who holds my life in his hands. فَوَاللَّهِ I swear by Allah. But the Prophet ﷺ would always do that whenever he was emphasizing something about the hereafter, about the akhirah, about the deen when he was teaching people. So he would add that level of emphasis through this. But in fact, the Prophet ﷺ tells us that do not la ta'manu halafan. That if you come across someone in business and trade that takes a lot of oaths excessively, like you're doing business with someone, transacting with someone, and they take an excessive amount of oaths, Wallahi, this is the best product. Wallahi, that's the best price. Wallahi, I'm hooking you up. Right? If you come across that, the Prophet said, don't believe that person. Be skeptical. Right? So you have to be very, very careful about this. But nevertheless, I just wanted to mention it here since the Qur'an makes reference of the fact that they swore by the might and the power of Fir'aun, that this is something that we obviously do not do. We do not engage in. Nevertheless, they said, وَقَالُوا بِعِزَّةِ فِرْعَوْنِ And why is Allah mentioning that? That almost seems, this is not mentioned in another place, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning it here that they swore by the might of Fir'aun. Why does Allah mention that? Because it's going to be very relevant in just a second. إِنَّا لَنَحْلُ غَالِبُونَ They swore by the might of Fir'aun that without a doubt, we shall be victorious. We're going to win here today. So in ayah number 45, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, فَأَلْقَى مُوسَىٰ عَصَاهُ And then Musa alayhi salam threw down his staff. فَإِذَا هِيَ إِذَا لِلْمُفَاجَعَةً مُفَاجَعَةً this idha means all of a sudden, unexpectedly. Like nobody saw it coming. And this is why I had mentioned that I would reference back to why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He talks about when Musa alayhi salam threw down his staff in the court of Fir'aun the first time, Allah mentions that, فَإِذَا هِيَ ثُعْبَانٌ مُبِينٌ Allah already uses the word thu'ban, which means like a large serpent. But then I, I had told you all that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala adds the extra adjective of mubinun. Like very evident. And I had told you all that in the next session I'll explain why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala adds that mubin. And it plays a role here. Because it was so evident that this is a serpent, because on that day in that gigantic field among tens of thousands of ropes and sticks on the ground, through whatever trickery and whatever mechanics that they were using to make them seem like they're moving and make them appear from a distance, when you're sitting up in the bleachers in the nosebleeds and you're looking down there and it looks like they're moving and these are snakes, that in that field among tens of thousands of things that look like snakes, when Musa salam put his staff down, it stood out from amongst everything. It became this giant serpent, thrashing around. And you clearly saw the difference. That's why Allah dropped that hint there, Mubin, and is playing a role here. فَإِذَا هِيَا Then all of a sudden, تَلْقَفُ تَلْقَفُ this word talqafu in the Arabic language, it means to swallow. To swallow whole. To swallow whole. And so then it started swallowing whole, just quickly, down the hatch. Ma everything that yafikun. Everything that they had tried, all the false uh, narrative that they had created, all the lies that they had spun. Everything that they had manufactured, it just swallowed it all up. Now, this has two meanings. Imam Razi rahimullahu ta'ala mentioned something very beautiful here. Very beautiful. 
First of all, it has a more obvious meaning. That all those sticks and ropes, tens of thousands of them, that were there in that field, this giant serpent that was just thrashing around, it just started moving through that entire arena, that entire field, so quickly, just swallowing up everything as it went. So all the little sticks and ropes that they had thrown down, that they had pretended or played some trick to make it seem like snakes, it swallowed it all up, all their lies. Okay? But Imam Razi says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses a very interesting word here, ma yafikun. Ifk in the Arabic language means like a falsification, like a lie that is manufactured very painstakingly. Okay? And so what he, what he says here is that the reason why Allah uses this word is not only did that giant serpent that the staff of Moses became, not only did it swallow up all the sticks and ropes, but it also completely swallowed up, meaning figuratively, that it obliterated all the lies and the entire narrative and the months of work that Fir'aun and all of his cronies had put into place. Think about what they had done. They delayed Musa a.s. for months. Then they sent out recruiters and scouts all throughout the land. Recruited every magician that they could find. Brought them all together. Poured tons of money into this endeavor. Paid them all off. Then they gathered as many people as they could from far and wide and incentivized everyone's attendance. All the money that went into that. Then they constructed this entire giant spectacle and put all of this together. And Musa salam just dropped his staff on the ground and everything was washed away in an instance. It all... House of cards just came crashing down. Completely came crashing down. One staff. He just said, Bismillah, and just dropped the staff on the ground. And then just stood back and just watched. And everything was washed away. And that's what happens. That's what happens. To put it very bluntly, that's what happens when you get in Allah's way. When you get in front of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when you get in the way of the truth, then that's what happens. You get washed away. You get wiped away. Ja al haqqu wa zahaq al baqi. Falsehood doesn't have to be destroyed. The truth just arrives. And falsehood dissipates. And that's why in the Qur'an, the classical parable is, the, is, a, is of light and darkness. The classic parable in the Qur'an is of light and darkness. Alright? And, nope. Alright, so it's of light and darkness. The classic parable. So what happens? If it's very, very dark in here, no lights are on, no windows, no light coming in externally, internally, nothing. Just completely dark in here. What do you do? Just turn the light on and what happens to dark darkness? It's gone. It dissipates. It's the absence of that light. And that's the example here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in another place in the Quran, He talks about how He dismantles falsehood and, and lies where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about how the truth يَدْمَغُهُ that He talks about how the truth bashes in the head of falsehood. It bashes its head in. It obliterates it. It destroys it. So it's unrecognizable. It's like it was never even there. It was never present. It's just gone. Vanishes in the blink of an eye. And that's exactly what happened here. And so, 
But what happens now? It's not enough. Because our goal isn't the obliteration, you know, isn't obliterating or the annihilation of that falsehood. That's not a worthwhile goal. Beating something that is frivolous, baseless, what have you accomplished if you defeat something baseless? You've accomplished nothing. But the actual goal is to do what? Wallahu mutimunu. Spreading the light. That's something we always have to remember. Yes, you guard against the enemy. You guard against the danger, the falsehood, the batin, the darkness. You guard against it. But your goal is not to defeat that darkness. No, 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 no. Your goal is much higher. The Prophet ﷺ, many of the ayat of the Qur'an, like I mentioned here, جَاءَ الْحَقُّ وَزَهَقَ الْبَاطِلِ where it talks about truth beating in the head of, crushing the head, the skull of falsehood. Many of these ayat, uh, uh, all these ayat, many of the sahaba, they interpreted that these ayat were about the day of Badr. Many of the Sahaba said that the, uh, the, one of the very first and clear manifestations of these ayat was what occurred on the day of Badr. Because what happened on the day of Badr is that truth and falsehood met, faced off against one another. And falsehood came with all its might, everything it had. And truth overcame it in a very convincing fashion. But if you pay attention to the narrations of the tone of the Prophet ﷺ, after the battle was over, you see something very interesting. The Prophet ﷺ was of course grateful. But the Prophet ﷺ was also had a very kind of almost sad and somber tone. The Prophet ﷺ, where they disposed of the bodies of a lot of the Quraysh that were killed, where they buried them, the Prophet ﷺ kind of stood there at the edge of that well, and the Prophet ﷺ even kind of said, and he, and he seemed almost, it's fair to say sad, that it had to come to this. And he said, I tried to tell you, but you people would not listen. فَهَلْ وَجَدْتُمْ مَا وَعَدَ رَبُّكُمْ حَقًّا فَقَدْ وَجَدْنَا مَا وَعَدَنَا رَبُّنَا حَقًّا We found that what God promised us was true. Did you find that what God promised you to be true? Did you find it to be true as well? So the goal was never destroying the enemy. The goal was spreading light. وَاللَّهُ مُتِمُّ نُورِهِ And we see that goal that the Prophet ﷺ had. It didn't matter how vicious an enemy was, the indiscretions that an enemy might have committed, if the enemy was ever able, was ever willing to listen, the Prophet ﷺ was willing to speak. Look throughout his life, you'll always see that. And so here we see in the story of Musa ﷺ, the enemy has been defeated. But that's not why Musa ﷺ came here today. What did he come here for? What we see next. In ayah number 47, excuse me, 46, Allah says, فَأُلْقِيَ أَسَّحَرَةُ سَاجِدِينَ أُلْقِيَ means that they were thrown down. أَسَّحَرَةُ The magicians were thrown down, سَاجِدِينَ into the position of sujood. Sajada in the Arabic language means to put your face on the ground. To prostrate. Muslim English word, all right? To basically humble yourself, fall onto the ground, put your face on the ground, humble yourself before Allah. فَأُلْقِيَ أَسَّحْرَةُ سَاجِدِينَ And it's a very interesting kind of construction of words. Where Allah does not say that they went into sajda, Allah says that the magicians were thrown down into sujood. But what threw them down? What forced them to go down? 
That is not specifically mentioned. The power of the might of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the miracle that they had just witnessed, the iman that was surging through their hearts in that moment, all of it, all of the above. Everything they had just experienced, because they experienced it all at once. They witnessed the miracle. They realized the truth of the message of Fir'aun. They were humbled in front of the greatness of Allah. The iman that was coursing through their hearts in that moment, the surge of iman that they felt, all of that came together in that moment. And there's something very interesting. That the claim that was made against Musa a.s. was that he performs magic. And this is why the Qur'an puts so much emphasis on the fact, بِكُلِّ سَحَارٍ عَلِيمٍ These were all the most expert magicians, experienced master expert magicians that could be found throughout the land. If it was magic that Musa a.s. was performing, these people were the most qualified to identify it. Takes one to know one. If he was a magician, they'd be the first to recognize it. And that's part of the reason why they were so blown away because they could stand there and say with absolute conviction that this is not sorcery. That's why the great poets, something very interesting you'll find about the time of the Prophet ﷺ, you have people who stay, remain stubborn and they were typically very power hungry, egotistical, egomaniacal, narcissists. That's the kind of people they were, Abu Jahl, Abu Lahab. But if you actually look through the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ and at the people around the Prophet ﷺ, all the most eloquent people, the great poets of their time, all became Muslim. The legendary poets of that time. Hassan ibn Thabit, Muslim. Ka'ab ibn Malik, Muslim. Abdullah ibn Rawaha, Muslim. Khansa, the, the female poet, Muslim. All the eloquent people who knew poetry and the language, they all became Muslim because they said, what he's doing is not poetry. What he's presenting is not poetry. This is, this is out of this world. No human being is capable of what he's presenting. This, is, this has to be from beyond us. This has to be from Allah. And so similarly, the magicians, that's why they were so blown away here. So they were thrown down, forced down into the position of Sajda. Humbled. Qalu, and, and there's one other linguistic nuance that Zamakhshari points out here. Another way to say that somebody fell into Sajda is the word Kharra. Kharra raki'an wa anab. Kharru sujjada. Alright? Kharra means to also fall down. Okay? But that's not the word Allah uses here. Allah uses the word ulqiyah. Because you see the connection back to how this entire situation started. They came into that battlefield throwing down their staffs and ropes, but they're the ones who ended up on the ground by the time everything was said and done. قَالُوا آمَنَّا بِرَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ and while there in sujood, they proclaimed and said, We believe in the Lord of the worlds. We believe in the master of all of humanity, Rabbil Alameen. God that Musa calls us to. And they specifically make clear. And why do they make clear? Because you got to remember when you are speaking in the presence of a delusional narcissist, and you say, I submit before God, you have to remind him that, no, 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 I'm not talking about you. Because he thinks you're talking about him. They said, Amanna bi Rabbil Alameen, and they clarified, Rabbi Musa wa Harun. The Lord of Musa and Harun. And it is at that particular point, that Fir'aun basically lost his mind. And we'll talk about in the next session what exactly Fir'aun did as a result of that. But before we disperse, inshallah, here for today, I wanted to share some very interesting things about the story of the magicians um, that some scholars have commented. Ikrima, 
who is a great mufassir, who is a student of Abdullah bin Abbas, radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. He actually said, Asbahu sahara wa amsu shuhada. They woke up in the morning as sorcerers and magicians about to go out there and argue against the case. They woke up in the morning as sorcerers and magicians. Okay? And they went out there in the morning to argue against the case for God. And by evening time, they had given their life for God. That's the power of guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides someone, then that's how powerful and that's how miraculous it is. Similarly, Imam Malik, rahimullah ta'ala, he comments on this, talking about how guidance is only in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam Malik said, Da'a Musa alayhi salam, Fir'auna arba'ina sanatan ila al-Islam, wa anna saharata amanu bihi fi yawmin wahid. Fir'aun, uh, Musa alayhi salam spent 40 years trying to convince Fir'aun of the message that Musa alayhi salam had brought and Fir'aun never came around. And the magicians in half a day accepted his message. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam spent over a decade personally talking to, reasoning with people like Abu Jahl and Abu Lahab and they never came around. And the Prophet ﷺ went for the battle of Khaybar and there was a simple man from the people of Khaybar. And when the battle started, he of course was on the other side, just figured, you know, it's us against them. But then he just kind of stopped and said, what am I doing? And so he just drops his weapons and he just walks right through the lines. And he comes out onto the other side and some of the Sahaba are like, whoa, whoa, wait, wait, wait. And the Prophet ﷺ said, let him come. And he came and he said, you know, I don't know I'm fighting against you. The Prophet said, then don't. He said, but what should I do? He said, believe in this. And he presents him the message of Islam. And he says, well, that makes a lot of sense. The Prophet said, I know. <laughs> and so the man puts his hand in the hand of the Prophet and becomes Muslim. And he says, what should I do now? He says, what do you think you should do? He says, I think I should fight on your side. The Prophet says, well, okay. And the man starts fighting and he dies as a martyr on that same day in the battlefield. And when the Prophet ﷺ saw his body at the end of the day, the Prophet ﷺ cradled his head in his hand. And the Prophet ﷺ says, دَخَلَ الْجَنَّةَ وَمَا سَجَدَ لِلَّهِ سَجَدَ he, This man went to paradise and he never performed a single sajda in his life. This is guidance. And Allah grants it to whomsoever He will. He just asks us for one thing. One demand Allah has to grant guidance. وَيَهْدِي إِلَيْهِ مَنْ أَنَا You gotta really want it from your heart. And that's what we're all here to try to achieve. It's to get to that point where we turn to Allah sincerely with our hearts and say, Oh Allah, guide us to the truth. Oh Allah, give us the mission and the purpose of our lives. Allow us to live our lives with purpose and meaning. And Allah grant us the reality of things. So with that, inshallah, we'll go ahead and conclude here. And we'll start, inshallah, with, I believe, ayah number 49 in the next session. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the ability to practice everything that was said and heard. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Nashar wa la ilaha illa anta. Nasafiruka wa natubulik.